making me do head sprints, and I'm so thrilled. Uh, and I'm especially, I mean, we have, I've practically never had as much fun in my professional life as I had with PT, with Jen, with Mark, and a couple of other colleagues finding you guys and learning about you, reading about you, and visiting you in your classrooms and your schools. It was pure joy to discover you and <coughs> uh, invite you on board, and then to have the chance to get you all together. We've been waiting and waiting for you all, all to meet each other, uh, and this is just really a blast. So, um, and I have to say, I wish that Paul Allen could have been in the van this morning on the way here, because we were talking a mile a minute <laughs> about our schools, our plans to go to scale, our problems, our ideas. So I want to encourage us all today. Come on in, Jen. We're just, okay. Um, I want to encourage all of us today to pretend like we're still around the dinner table last night or we're still in the van and just keep talking to each other. It's obviously going to be more structured than that because uh, that's how it is. We just made an agenda that has some structure to it because we actually want each of you to uh, have the floor for a little while, but we want the conversation to just keep flowing the way it has <coughs> since the first minute that you met each other. The way we structure the agenda is that today, in general, is a day about the work that you're doing now, how you think about it, where it's located, uh, it's, your, it's about your work and you're thinking about your work right now. Maybe where you've come from, maybe where you're headed to. Um, and we want to give you all plenty of opportunity today to share that and engage with one another about it. And look at what do you have in common? What do you, uh, how do you vary? Um, what sparks go off in your mind as you learn about one another's work? Um, what is what is at the heart of the Allen Distinguished Educator program that you all represent? What does all of this mean for you and your work? 
So we just encourage you to, as you listen and as you share, to jot down your thoughts because we're going to just be asking you all during the day to talk about what you're thinking about. Okay? Tomorrow, well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't skip tonight. Tonight, um, uh, I guess we'll all go back to the hotel at the end of the day, and then we're going to go from there to a great restaurant. I forget the name of it. Something 360? 360. Local 360. The people in this foundation understand their food, <laughs> and they appreciate their food. And we have never, in the couple of years that we have worked sure. to get... We have not only never had a bad meal, we haven't had spectacular meals. So um, wherever we're going to go tonight is going to be good. And then tomorrow, we're, the pitch of tomorrow's agenda is more toward the future. You'll be grounded in one another's work and thinking, and the agenda will be pitched more toward the future, uh, how the work that you do can uh, achieve greater visibility, and greater reach so that more kids have the chance to have the kinds of experiences that you have been creating in your schools and classrooms. Um, and Larry is the only one of the four advisors that's here in person. One of them was, another was going to be here in person, but like a lot of people these days, she's, she came down with pneumonia. Unfortunately, it happened to be this week. So she just let us know late last night that she can't be here, which is really unfortunate. Um, but tomorrow morning, Larry and other advisors, Larry will be here in person, and other advisors will be here through Skype, and they will uh, talk with you and share some of their thoughts and wisdom about what they have been through and learned by being an innov education innovator and growing uh, exciting programs. Um, and then we'll, get, we'll engage you all in thinking about the future and helping one another do that. So that's the structure of the agenda. Uh, and we'll also tell you more tomorrow is kind of the day where we're going to tell you more about the bolts of the program, how are the grants work, um, what, is, what do we have in mind for you over the course of this year, and why, and how you get to help build your own program. So that, those nuts and bolts are going to be tomorrow. So um, before I hand it over to Dave um, from the foundation, does anybody have a question or anything like that? Or did I forget to say anything? Shall we just go, huh, Dave? Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I hope, uh, hope you're all well rested. I'm glad to hear that there was some um, it sounds like camaraderie on the band coming over. We were hoping to, uh, to try to help develop last night. Um, the first thing I want to get out of the way is I've been I've been to lots of gatherings with progressive educators over the years, and I know that among the, the sort of the, the key traits of that subculture um, is, a, is a fierce desire to eradicate the lecture from classrooms globally. And we bring them together all the time and ask them to sit down and listen to PowerPoints all day. And then they get to the bar and, and they grumble about the irony <laughs> of um, having to listen to lectures at, this, uh, at a conference dedicated to alternative ways of helping students learn. So if you do the math on the agenda, we have a seven-hour agenda today, five hours of which are mini lectures by PowerPoint. So I just wanted to acknowledge the irony and feel free to mumble at the bar tonight um, over at the restaurant. Um, I want to just talk about three things this morning. Um, sort of like why, why Paul's interested in this, um, where we hope this program could go, and um, what will be some of the joys of being um, the very first cohort of um, Allen Distinguished Educators. So about Paul um, and about this program, I think one of the bottom lines of, of Paul's philanthropy in education is to increase the number of students who have the opportunity to have transformational experiences through their education. So the more kids can have that kind of experience and, and alter the trajectory of their lives for the good, um, the more opportunity <coughs> will have done. And that desire is rooted in his personal experience in school uh, as somebody who did who feels like he's got the most of his learning sort of in the per, um, in the periphery of the classroom someone who did most of his learning um, most of his productive learning um, tinkering on his own um, and so forth 
Um, it's also good in his personal experience as an entrepreneur himself and the way it transformed his life in a fairly, um, in a spectacular way. Um, and he's he always had a particular, I think, um, dedication to teachers in particular because his own mother was a teacher, and I think his father was some kind of an educator as well. Yeah, his, his father was the head librarian at UW, so he really grew up sort of walking through the stacks uh, at UW. So the, the, so the motive is deeply personal, rooted in, in, pers in, in, in personal experience, and experience that he had that he knows his work. So you can see woven through that, the, the desire for, um, for uh, an education that has kids um, doing as well as thinking, acting as well as listening, um, and creating as well as performing, right? Um, as well as, um, and, and a, a belief in grounded in experience uh, for what the, the power of, of, of entrepreneurialism and all that that kind of encodes by way of creativity um, and independence and um, trying to find solutions to human problems. And finally, and, teach, and finally teachers. All woven together, I think, fairly neatly in this program, which not only honors the work that you've done, but is going, to, is going to try to figure out ways to help you actually reach more kids and transform more lives. You are the first cohort, um, and this is actually a pilot program. Um, we're trying it out. Uh, we're going to do a lot of learning this year. Um, one of the, um, uh, the features of being this, this inaugural cohort is you're going to, um, uh, as, as, as Sue mentioned last night, really be helping us learn how to get this program right, how to refine it, how to improve it, how to make sure it has all the power it can have. Um, my personal aspiration for the program, right, is that um, will we break beyond the, uh, the five states that is, that is confined to now, um, so that eventually this becomes a, a national program. I'd like a, a la the Milken um, Award, that, that over the years we build a, 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 an alumni network of professionals who work together to help, to help advocate, evangelize, and help one another. Um, who knows, if it gets big enough, this could be international, right? So I, it's fun, I, once I wrap my mind around this program and what it could possibly do, um, I got really excited. But this is just me talking at this point. It's still a pilot, and we're still learning together, and we're hoping for the best, and we're hoping you can help us um, make this into something that could be successful and big, and is, and is impactful to as many kids' lives as possible. Um, so that's all I really wanted to say this morning by way of framing. I don't know if anybody has any questions about anything I had or whether there's anything Sue would like to add. But no, I think you did a great job. Great. And if not, oh yeah, Larry. Having been in parallel paths, I can't wait to read your memoirs. <laughs> <laughs> so Larry and I met um, a long back, time ago. Yeah, right. back when High Tech High was just a construction just, site. Just starting. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So this is, a, this is a little reunion for him and me. Um, Mark's going to come up now and talk a little bit about um, what really makes this unique um, a program um, within the sort of the broad domain of educational philanthropy. So, Mark, do you want to come up? Sure. <clears throat> I don't know if we, can, if we have the slides on this machine or not. Um, we got Scott's up there. things completely off. Thank <laughs> you. 
Is it up? Yeah. Oh, nice. Good job. Well, let's see if we can do a full screen here. Ooh. All right. <clears throat> um, let me just say, so I'm Mark St. John, and we started Inverness Research Associates 30 years ago, 20 years ago. We've all been working away, studying investments in the improvement of education, essentially is the way we say it. And the way that works is uh, that there is this phenomenon in our educational system of outside benevolent agents, such as the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation, the National Science Foundation, Pew Trusts, all kinds of foundations that want to make external investments. Um, uh, they want to put money into the system, not for the sake of running it, but for the sake of improving it. And so we've had 30 years of studying the efforts of foundations and, and others, agencies and so forth, to make improvements in the educational system. And there have been a lot of different strategies and, and thoughts about how to do that. And so what I'm going to do today is try to place the uh, Allen Distinguished Educator Award Program in a broader context of many, many decades of trying to improve education. Uh, and, and I'm hoping this will give you a kind of big picture of what you're part of, where you're situated. So these foundations uh, fund typically projects, five-year projects, three-year projects, two-year projects of different kinds. And the idea is um, that through that funding, they will get some leverage, something happens, so that we build the capacity of the system, or we create changes in the way the system operates, or perhaps we just uh, do professional development, get teachers to learn some new things. But all that, in theory, results in change in classroom practice, and hence change in student experience, and hence change in benefits to students, or more recently, narrowed down to student achievement. So this is the game that, that we're part of, this bigger idea. And I would just say over 30 years, I have not found a more difficult problem than making intelligent investments in the improvement of education. Going to the moon, all of these are much easier than improving the learning experiences of students in Buffalo and Cleveland and Los Angeles. And this is the hardest problem I know. I've run, and I was a physicist. I studied lots of hard problems. This is the hardest design problem I know. Um, so this is not a trivial idea. And I think foundations far underestimate how difficult this is to do and to do it well. <clears throat> so the kind of investments we've seen are curriculum development. We had NSF doing all the new curriculum back in the 60s. We see new curriculum coming out all the time. Now we see digital curriculum. So we see new things coming up. And they're great. They're great new contributions. Uh, and, and with almost all of these, you could say they're necessary but not sufficient. Uh, and there's also a whole issue of if you do temporary investments, how does that create long-term benefits? Um, so temporary investments, a little a change over time in a small place, and then the, there's lots of theories about how that spreads and goes broader. So we have <coughs> curriculum development things, professional development for teachers. Uh, of course, you may have noticed that we're always developing new standards. So you may have heard of Common Core, NGSS, and the theory here is, well, if we can get our vision clear enough then that will drive the system forward, particularly if we couple it with good assessments, and then we can kind of test in with a new vision, better practice, and so forth. So this is a theory that's been now around for 20 or 30 years. I, I don't know. I'm still, uh, I think it's, it's uh, at best, the jury is still out. So everybody has got a theory of how are we going to make the system stronger and better. And, and there are all these different approaches we've had over the, over the decades. <clears throat> Uh, another interesting fact for foundations is that they can't just go out and buy student achievement. They would love to say to Cleveland or to Seattle or to San Francisco, here's some money. We'd like to raise student achievement scores X, Y, Z. Uh, here's the money just that we'd like to buy some more student achievement. You can't do that. You have to work through the system, through the machine to do it. And you're, you're at four degrees of separation at the, at, at the minimal. So, the student achievement, if you want to call it narrow in terms of test scores, or broad in terms of uh, useful learning of skills and knowledge and, and attitudes, uh, depends in part, but only in part, on high quality instruction. 
So we have to have a theory that says, how do we change the learning experience, the quality of the instruction that the student gets, the amount of instruction, the quality, et cetera? And there are lots of ways to do that. That, in turn, depends on the health of the system. To have high-quality instruction, you need good teachers, really good teachers who know what they're doing, empowered with the curriculum, and in a supportive context so that the assessments, the policies, the classroom routines, uh, the environment in the school, all of that has to come together to create the conditions under which good instruction can happen. What we lack in this country is what Doug Engelbart uh, from Stanford, recently deceased, a wonderful guy, called we lack an improvement infrastructure. So we have an infrastructure to run the schools. We have school buses and schools and so forth, and those are funded and functional. But we don't have what other industries have, which is an infrastructure that's ongoing that constantly is improving, continuous improvement. And this is what is really made up of episodic projects. It does not, is not, we do not have permanent improvement infrastructures. The drug industry has permanent research labs and so forth to improve their product. We don't have such things in education. It tends to be episodic with short-term investments. And hence, this is a problem. And this, this very structure makes it very difficult for foundations to actually do what they want to do. So structurally, there's a real problem here. <clears throat> there's a little bit of an alternative way of thinking with this ADE strategy that I, that I find encouraging and um, sensible. Um, so we can talk about this and go into this. Uh, but here again, we have a foundation that says we would like to invest in the improvement of education so that young people get better learning experiences, more learning experiences. <clears throat> and there are a couple ways, really important ways this is different. So one is we want to harness the untapped power of creative and entrepreneurial educators. This is an initiative that is inside out. It's uh, done by and for and with the people it is meant to serve, the teachers. The teachers are the engine and the horsepower of this initiative, as opposed to a, a view of investing from the outside where the teachers are either the recipients or the victims or the uh, whatever it is of somebody else's idea. So you guys, ADEs, are the engine. You're not the recipient. You're not the, you're not the uh, patient in the bed receiving the doctor's newest treatment. You are the doctors. You are administering yourself. Heal thyself, ADEs. So you are, you are the workers. It is the inside out. And this is not a, there are other initiatives, the National Writing Project, some other initiatives that have said, you know, maybe teachers are the solution, not the problem. In general, they're seen as the problem. But there's a, there's a way of thinking where the teachers are the solution. And so I would argue if it's ever going to have a better system, it's got to be a bootstrap operation where teachers are teaching teachers, teachers are helping teachers, teachers are leading the way. Um, so that's a deep belief in this initiative. Um, the other part of this is we're tapping the power not only of good teachers, but of entrepreneurial teachers, of teachers who have the ability to take an entrepreneurial mindset and a set of entrepreneurial skills and not only have their classrooms be brilliant, but have ways of growing the influence of their classrooms, of growing the reach of their classrooms, of growing the visibility of their classrooms. So this is all a very important part of the theory here. Um, and the goal, long term, and in multiple ways, we'll look at this a couple of different ways, is to increase the number of students who have access to such powerful experiences and the power of those experiences themselves. So it's a, a number of kids times the power of the experience kind of, uh, kind of goal here. <clears throat> um, when I went to visit Amir, uh, <laughs> I had this sort of shocking insight um, uh, that, that I want to share with you. And I, I don't know if it's true or not, but I think it's worthy of discussion. Um, maybe not this early in the morning, but <laughs> it's worthy of discussion at some point. Um, I kept asking Amir, do you do egg drop experiments? Do you do this kind of thing? Do you do that? He says, no. We just do engineering. I'm doing real engineering. I don't want to do school activities. I want to do engineering. I said, why? And he said, well, because schools should prepare kids for life. Why don't you just do in schools what you do in life? Why would you do something else? <laughs> why, why, would you go, why would you go do something else than what, you, what you're going to do in life? So I, when I went to visit Amir, he had the kids learning how to measure the um, uh, calipers or the rods or something and get the specs on them and order them for the robot they were building. Well, this is not trivial, and 
and the kids were really good at figuring out how to read a table and order the rods. So this wasn't, you know, if you, this isn't like how do you use a caliper, this was order the rods for the machine you're building. This is not, it's authentic. There's no preparation for anything. You're doing the thing. You're can doing I, engineering. Can I say one thing on that? <laughs> I think it's really critical to, to, to say that this isn't a disparaging statement toward the types of projects that you just described. It's just that I did those projects and through the evolution of doing those projects and looking at the outcomes of those types of projects, I believe, and I could be you know, incorrect about this, that we're moving into a space that is going to be more effective. And just in terms of the student's own impression of what they're doing, they feel like they're working on more authentic things. And that, in, that intrinsic feeling of working on something that seems more authentic is, is important. If they feel like they could watch a YouTube video on how to do an egg drop and do it at their house, why are they coming to my classroom to do an egg drop? They have eggs, they have foam, they have all that stuff. So yeah. I just want to be very clear because I know that some folks, and even myself, we still do some things like that, but the idea is to move beyond that, and it is in no way disparaging of those types of things because I think they're all a part of the evolution of the growth of how we take this education, this other, this other realm is where I'm trying to go. That's it. Great. <laughs> I just, I, I, I don't even characterize it like this. So I, we don't want any more irrelevant interruptions like this. I mean, this is, this is a, no, it's brilliant. This is exactly why we're here, is, is to, have, uh, to have exactly this kind of articulation of what it is we're doing and why we're doing it and so forth. So it, this is terrific fun. The, po the point is, Amir got me really thinking about this. And, uh, and, and, uh, and then at the same time, I'm working with a lot of initiatives that are working with standards and tests and so forth. So the, 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 the insight that came to me was something like the following, that many of you ADEs came from industry uh, or had industry experience or a real world experience before, and you, and you went into schools with teachers and said, why are we teaching them these things? Why don't we just teach them what they do in life? Why don't we just have them do real things? And, and I think the answer is the following, that over the past really 100 years, there's been an evolution to say, yeah, schools are to prepare kids for life, but we don't really know how to do that generically and so forth. So for, I don't know, 100 years or so, we developed the disciplines. So we developed the disciplines and say, well, let's teach them mathematics, let's teach them science, let's teach them history. These are great, the disciplines are great things. And the, and the theory is, well, if we know the disciplines separately and we really study them, that will give us a skill and knowledge base that will prepare us for life. So, so we're one step removed now from preparing people directly for life, life skills in a way, and say, the disciplines, and I'm not, I, I think that's a great thing. The disciplines are a powerful body of knowledge and a good thing to do. And then somewhere recently, we said, well, you know what, the disciplines are a little bit difficult to figure out. How do we know we're really teaching the essence of the disciplines? And particularly, what is it kids should know and be able to do? Because ultimately, if we can't measure it, then we can't get credit for it. And so there was a big press to say, we have to have measurable things in school. And so we want to be able to measure things, so we uh, evolved the standards. And there were standards in 1990, um, uh, the NRC standards, and then now new standards. And the standards are the essence of the disciplines, if you will, or broken, the, the, the disciplines sort of in fractals, or broken down, projections of the disciplines to say, well, there are these practices, there is these knowledge, there's these skills. These are the things you should know and be able to do if you're really a historian, or, you, or if you're a mathematician. The kind. So now, we don't really teach the disciplines, we teach the standards. So there's these bite-sized bits of skills and knowledge that are the standards. And then, of course, we said, well, yeah, but we can't measure the standards. So what we need are assessments that hopefully match up against the standards. And so we've gotten this pathway to preparing kids for life, which is three or four steps removed. And these are sort of surrogate things. And unfortunately, with a measurement and accountability context, now what happens is schools are saying, hey, our job is to help people do well on tests. And it's all well-meaning, and you can see the, the logic and the derivative. But again, when I was, uh, spent time with Amir that day and we were talking and thinking about it, preparing kids for tests, and the particularly tests we have now, doesn't really feel like we're preparing kids for life. And there's a sense of this, this chain has gotten too far removed and what we really like to do is have powerful experiences that can prepare kids for life. And probably those things will also do well on the test. But we're, we've, we've, we've chosen to take this detour, this long detour, to get kids ready for life. Mark, and I, have to, I have to add another anecdote, because I know you went to see Amir's class, which I didn't have a chance to do, unfortunately. But I can't help but say 
at at this point. When we were in Gaber School, the kids wanted to build a bridge from one space to another space. So in order, they didn't just study the theory of bridges, which they did study, but the test was, can you walk across the bridge? That's, the, that's preparation for life, right? The bridge is safe or it's not safe. It's either constructed or it's not constructed, and it's built by these kids in school. So there's just, there are so many examples in everyone's uh, place right. of right. the direct link from, right. from really doing it. What she just said was I really love that that's real true high stakes. Testing. That's high stakes testing. Yeah. That is high stakes testing. Walking Performance testing. Yeah. I'm going to reiterate that theme in my presentation. So you, good. You oh, sorry. No, 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 no. That's, that's sorry. good. So we're, I'm sure we're going to be talking to the choir, but that's good. We need to practice that. Yeah. that rhetoric. Let me let me move on quickly because I'm I'm we're, we're I'm indulging. Let, let me um, just say to you, there is a theory of a logic model, a kind of connection, and, and it goes something like this. This is not exact, but I, I wanted you to get a sense of how the foundation and Inverness Research is working with the foundation is trying to um, picture this. And it goes something like this, that the foundation's investment uh, selects and, and, and brings together these teacherpreneurs, the ADEs, uh, entrepreneurial teachers, and provides with a support program. And the combination of those two working together yields a couple different things. One is, is it re yields a community, hopefully a growing, ongoing community, as Dave was mentioning early, of your peers, your kindred spirits, that is mutually supportive, A, and B, also provides a, a, a powerful face to the world uh, and a voice to the world about this kind of work and this approach. We also want this program to help you grow, increase the reach and the visibility of your own programs. We want you to expand your work. Um, so there's a direct kind of outreach and growth. And finally, through visibility and broader influence, and making the arguments, we hope that this program will have powerful ripple indirect effects um, uh, out in the world. So let me give you an example. Um, I had the opportunity to work with Frank Oppenheimer at the Exploratorium when he was first starting it up. And so we worked at this museum. He had no intention of changing science. Programs. He wanted to build a unique place that had these certain characteristics. So it, it held very true to its values and its vision. And he built this science museum slash perception museum. And as a result, there are now two, three hundred other museums like that in the United States. But that wasn't his goal. But his example was so powerful, so compelling, that it just pulled, it, it was a disruptive technology. It created a new genre of things in the world. Um, Alice Waters, Chez Panisse, local food movement. She wanted to do one thing well. She did, and the idea was so powerful, it spread. So those are ways in which, if we have visible, powerful examples of different ways of doing it by different people with different values, this can have a very wide in impact on the system. Um, <clears throat> oh, yeah. Yep. Um, great. So this is, this is, this is it. So, the last thought is, I think not only are we about engineering and entrepreneurship and, and, and creating those experiences as kids, we're also about making a statement and proving the feasibility of having teacherpreneurship, of having teachers as the powerful driving agent of change within our systems. And this takes a lot of work. It takes work to have the programs be brilliant. It also takes work, as we were talking last night, to do the political engineering necessary to survive, to find a niche in the systems that don't always want you there, that aren't always appreciative. So it's, it's, a two, it's an internal thing of making the program strong. It's an external thing of doing the politics and the arranging so that your little flower can grow in this field that isn't always excited about having you growing there. Um, so there, there's those two facets of the work. And I think all of us have, uh, all of you, have a lot of experience in talking about those things. So what happens when we have teacherpreneurship? Well, we're going to have these uh, <coughs> development, refinement, growth of the experiences for youth. Uh, we're going to create powerful, visible examples in your program. Um, we are going to um, provide incentive and motivation and safe harbor for other teacherpreneurs. Uh, we are going to provide a catalyst for additional programs and policies. Hopefully, people will begin to see this approach, this way of working, as a more uh, viable, desirable way to go about doing things. 
Uh, we talked about finding these niches, engineering new relationships and structures in the system. We're going to figure out how to have charter schools or academies or courses or how do we, how do we create the niches within the system so that these programs can work. Uh, and we're going to really uh, validate the idea of teacherpreneurship. So that's, that's a kind of big picture of how both individually working here as ADEs, but also as a collective and as a big initiative, you're the leading edge, you're the leading cohort for a much bigger idea of, uh, of, of creating a change strategy, creating a way of bringing about change in the schools and for the schools that's a little different than what we've seen before. So I'll stop there. I really like, I have to tell you, I like the word teacherpreneur a lot. But one of the things I just wrote to myself is, you know, what's my vision is uh, studentpreneurs, right? Because that's ultimately our goal is to make these our little entrepreneurs that they're, um, they, they see the world as an opportunity that they can go do what they want and make it. I think there's a tremendous shadowing symmetry. The, the, the winning design last night, as I remember, had this idea yeah. of, of layers, of, of teacher student layers. Right. I think there's great symmetry, great, uh, you can ask if it's true for the student, is it true for the teacher? If it's true for the teacher, is it true for the student? I think there's great uh, back and forth there. I agree. Yeah. Um, this uh, like, you know, this notion of picking a couple of us out of the out of the spectrum of interesting projects that are going on out there and then, you know, building this cohort kind of presupposes the possibility that um, part of that validation comes from identification and you know, uh, uh, bringing visibility to our programs and things like that. Often I find the, you know, the unintended consequence of that is a larger percentage of my time is spent in the communication side of things rather than in the doing, you know. And so I was already like working with my board to figure out like, okay, how are we going to handle the new press load? How do we handle, you know, is that is that an aspect that this project can help us with? That your expertise and can we sometimes just deflect them to you guys before we try to give them a whole vision, you know, centric, project centric vision of changing education? Or? Yeah, you you are going to help us identify the tensions and, yeah. the, and, the, and the issues where we need to work together. Um, now, I, I know that the Foundation and Inverness are thinking about these things and so forth, and we can say a few things, and then, we're, as, as we always say to the kids, we're going to figure it out together. Right. We don't know the answer, okay, but we're going to figure it out <laughs> together. But, but, and, but I do think that's really yeah. interesting area for us to think about as we shape this program in the future, yeah. that as, as, as we learn about, like, what are the key attributes of these programs? What make them successful? We could be a resource for yeah. meeting. Right. You know, That's if I idea. could just point, you know, like the collection of things you got from us, right. if those had been, you know, like distilled and curated a little bit, we might have a resource. We could just say, oh, it's okay. part of a new spectrum of. It's actually one of our uh, goals for this year um, is in um, to do exactly that to discern traits and patterns across programs that can be converted into kind of a, like a, a free the white paper. Well, yeah. Well, and, a, yeah. and a resource center on our website where yeah. we can point. That would be great. Yeah. Just that, because I think fully 70% of the value of what we do at BrightWorks is just that we exist. Right. You know, and, right. and other educators kind of point at us, and I often have conversations right. with administrators where it's like, yes, it's working. Trust that teacher who wants to start something like that. Give them all the support you can. It's going to pay off hugely. And that's just about building that confidence, helping them support that experiment, whether it's in-house or it's an after-school program. Or so let me just say, I think the visibility part of this is really important, and the sharing uh, uh, at all levels with teachers, with, with press, with everything else. Um, and it happens at two levels. One is we hopefully will empower each of you to be, you know, more successful at sharing your individual programs um, and, and to find ways to do that. So, you know, Glenn worked his way into the San Francisco Chronicle yesterday. Um, and, and I wrote in on his coattails. And you wrote in on his coattails. <laughs> I was wondering what that relationship was. Yeah, yeah. So, so that, that's, that's, the, award, I that's the individual part. 
we'll also collectively document. We, Inverness yeah. is producing a, a Bright Spots, a, a document about you uh, over the first year, and uh, Vulcan will find ways to to publicize you Great. further. So. Yeah. But, but I think there will be a tension of how do I put my time into doing, do I, do I keep talking about myself uh, or do I, you know. I mean, frankly, I just love the idea of being connected to you guys now, you know, separating the infrastructural support that they're giving, the notion that we might, like, start sharing in an ad hoc way, in a more casual way, just be great to know we're not alone out there on the, you know, we're out at the edge already. Sometimes it feels windy and cold out there, and it's, it's nice to see you guys. Yeah, we heard we heard a lot of that. So that that is well. That, that's that's in, in the plan. Okay, we should probably. And I think yeah. really quick though, because we don't Real want to. Real quick, yeah. I would say, I've kind of had this spotlight experience, and it's only helped my program. And what I've had to do, and I think you need to start thinking about whether this. I think every each of us as individuals have to decide whether this is something we are interested in doing. But you may have to rethink your role. Yeah. And you may have to look at what is your role. It, my, I'm not in the classroom as much anymore. I teach the lead design stuff, but I am the voice of the program now. Yeah. And that is actually making us more successful, not less successful. And I've had to reinvent what I do and reinvent my job title, etc. So that would be what I would say is don't, just don't be myopic and not realize that, like, stay, stay so focused on what you think the goal is because yeah. you may be closing doors yeah, yeah. by not allowing yourself to be more open to other opportunities. Yeah. I just put, we just rolled this whiteboard over here this morning so we could keep track of big, huge topics that come up that really need attention during these two days and actually into the future too. And this is clearly one. So I just put a bookmark it there. Great. And now I want to hand the floor over to Scott. And I want to say as Scott starts making his way up, when we were sort of pulling names out of hats and making a list of who was going to go first and second, Scott got the, I don't know if it's the long straw or the short straw, <laughs> to go first. And what, I, what we did not think about is that Scott is the only person here whose boss is here. Oh. And how did we somehow manage completely? That's the tie. That's the tie. <laughs> that's the tie. Right. So somehow, without even It just makes you careful on the challenge of that part, right? Yeah. <laughs> we, had, we didn't even realize what we were doing to him, but he's bravely going to just jump in and, and go. Hold on. So you're going to have to bear with me a little bit. I the, uh, decided this is a reason to try a new software program. So whether that's a good idea or a terrible idea, I don't know yet. So you're exhibiting risk-taking behavior like I am. A lot, of, a lot of late nights that were unnecessary. And I hope they're necessary. We ready to go? OK. So I want to start off by saying the obvious, and that's that I'm excited to be here, and that, that I'm balancing right now uh, quite a bit of anxiety around that and also a little bit of an eagerness that I can be done with mine and then relax and you know, look, look at yours. And I know I've already gotten to know and I'll get to know you all a little more personally over the next few days, but I want to take the kind of get to know me section and talk a little bit about some of the high points in my career because I, I think that's kind of what has defined me. And it started uh, in college. I started a, a marine design and construction company. And that was really my first foray into complete entrepreneurship, really experimenting, getting uh, client management. And about the same time, I was also working for L3 Communications, designing RFID hardware for tracking IT assets. And that was the complete opposite side of the spectrum, where I really got exposed to bureaucracy, both with Vandenberg and working as part of a, a large company. And I then went ahead and got my professional engineer's license. And that was my probably most traditional period of my life where I worked with uh, designing Lucille Packard Children's Hospital and uh, did general commercial work, data center, stuff that like, engineers do. And, but at that same time, I landed a contract with uh, Bloom Energy, who at that time was a startup. They, they make fuel cells. And I really got to taste what it was like to be part of a startup. And even though I was an external contractor, that was a huge transformative experience for me, and that's one of my favorite pictures on the bottom. I got to sit next to like Schwarzenegger and Larry Page, and that was exciting. Um, I then started an energy division at my company, um, and I, my big contract was working with Kaiser Permanente. I uh, ran their energy procurement program, and had 
um, really was just completely immersed in finance, contracting, facility management, all these new things I'd never done before. And that was um, a very interesting time. And from that, I really started to specialize in energy economics. And I, I mean, I, I started Googling what net present value was on my phone the first day. Like, I knew nothing. But in the end of it, I was developing models that looked at uh, future performance of energy systems, time of use tariffs, and all these things. And I'm still very convinced that about 80% of energy projects have completely faulty economics. That's another presentation entirely. <laughs> and I also dabbled a little bit in research. I uh, worked with Israel-based panoramic power. And uh, we actually got a million dollar grant from the Bird Foundation to jointly develop their energy monitoring hardware. So that was also pretty fun. But after all of this, I was still very frustrated um, and a little bored. But frustrated because I, I really didn't like how business was done. Um, I felt that people in very high positions struggled with very simple um, decisions. And often when there was like math and math-like topics were in there, people just blanked out. And that, that drove me nuts. And so my parents are both K-3 teachers, have been my whole life. And so I'd always thought like, oh, once I make my money, I'll be a teacher. Later in life, maybe I'll be a teacher. But at this point in my career, I actually just said, you know what? I need to think. Took a two-month sabbatical, um, tried to find a way to, uh, a free way to get into education. Found uh, Math for America, which kind of led me to hearing about High Tech High. And from the moment I stepped foot in the first High Tech High building, I said, I'm going to work here. And if we fast forward a little bit to now, I've been at High Tech High for three years. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the atmosphere, for those that aren't familiar with it. Um, some realizations I've had there, a little bit about my program, and then how that looks through the lens of student work. So when you first walk into High Tech High, you notice the architecture, the glass, the high ceilings, the natural light. But if you sit for a minute and you look around, you start to notice the walls. There is student work everywhere. Design, art, engineering. But then once you settle in, you really notice that the student activity, the focus, the industry, the engagement. And you don't hear teachers, you don't hear bells, you hear students. And High Tech High is a K through 12, um, school is going to show my classroom in a bit, that's my class. Um, it's a K through 12 charter system. Uh, we were actually founded on uh, the idea that we could create talent for the local tech industry. Um, that being said, uh, we are a self-titled liberal arts school. My classroom is a classroom with a couple power tools in the corner. I have computers that are five to six years old. I don't have a wood shop. I don't have a machine shop. So it is, it is not sometimes the tech people think it is, but it has continued to be um, a site of progressive education. And as I've been teaching there, I've realized some things. And you can probably completely understand all of this by just looking at it. But um, it's really kind of sadly representative of my daily thought process. And maybe that's just what teaching is. But uh, as I've gone through my first few years, I've started to distill a few things that are just continual thoughts. And I'm going to frame it through the lens of um, what an employer might ask. So if you had to decide between hiring one of two people, who would you choose? A, the person with perfect skills and qualifications but lacking grit, or B, the person with exceptional grit and lacking some of the other bits. So, B. <laughs> and the truth is that 98% of employers, when surveyed, choose B. And that may not be new news. You might say, like, oh, yeah, that, that kind of makes sense. And this has been part of our cultural identity for as long as anyone can remember. And I think it's who we as Americans think we are. But I would argue that it's also who we're really trying to be. And um, academia has jumped on board. You see some names up here you probably recognize. And they all recognize the value of grit, but few people have really said, how do we improve that in students? What are the things we do to make that um, happen? And if we look to the world of business and behavioral psychology, authors like Paul Stoltz have been doing this in business for 25 years. This is not just a need of education. It is a need of life. And if we, if we look to them, there are some things we can distill. And I've been lucky enough to work with Paul over these last few weeks, and I've distilled a few of his ideas that I think help make this kind of an achievable goal for us. And I broke it down to four characteristics. And each of these is, I think, significant, but also separate and teachable. And I'm going to go through these quickly in the, for time. Growth mindset. Um, we can look the question. Has happened? Five minutes. Left? 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, wow. Uh, <laughs> the belief that their abilities can be developed through dedication. I've only had to go on six and minutes and 50 seconds. Uh, the, the ability that you can really change, and I think without that, nothing else matters. And so we can really lean on Carol Dweck to improve that in kids. Also resilience, and that's really just kind of your immediate response to adversity. How do you deal with it? Um, intensity and tenacity, really nose to the grindstone work ethic, and the ability to get back up when you're kind of put down. And I ask you, how do we actually increase these in, in classrooms so that we can actually see these characteristics in our students? And I call it adversity by design. And the first thing you need to do is develop the need. And if you think about grit as an immune response to adversity, we need to have the adversity in order to develop that response. And so we have to design it in. Um, and I like to do it through product-focused projects. Mine are all engineering, because that's what I'm interested in, but I think it could be done through anything. And as part of those, there needs to be a high perception of difficulty. Students need to think, oh, this isn't something students could normally do. This is really hard. And it also has to be skill-based. They have to come out with a tangible skill friends might not have, or something they can rely on in the future. And it's also where we have to be very careful about um, how we interact with students, because how they deal with that adversity on a day-to-day -day basis is what has the potential to rewire their brain, but it also has the potential, if we're not careful, to reinforce existing bad habits. So we have to be very conscious of how we do kind of the day-to-day, moment-to-moment, what you say to kids. Um, also, uh, in my case, I teach 14-year-olds, and adversity is by definition difficult. And um, they may not have the uh, emotional maturity or even cognitive ability yet to deal with this, so you have to be very careful and really take the time to scaffold for each kid so you don't end up just burning them out. And that's where we get to project scaffolding where we, we really do manage the adversity for every kid. We differentiate for every kid, because what's hard for one kid is not for another. Um, and how does this look through student work? When I, when I first started teaching, I kind of did the normal physics -y project. I built air cannons and Tesla coils and things like that. Okay, go, go. And then I started focusing on more comprehensive projects. And that oh, uh, had a lot of trial and error, and error, and error, and then I really got to see though what it was like when a kid finished a project like that. Oh my God! <laughs> and, and then I moved down to teach freshmen, and um, or after, this was actually one of the comprehensive projects where uh, it's called Senior Squared, and this toy was built and designed by a student for a senior citizen as part of a project we called Senior Squared. And then I moved down to freshman, and this is a project where with the help of naval architects, we actually built, uh, designed from scratch, and built boat holes, and had them thermal formed at a, a parent's factory, did all the electronics, basically made custom RC boats, and um, this was part of a joint humanities project where they actually studied piracy in all of its forms, and our project actually culminated in a merchants versus pirates naval battle, which is kind of fun. Then, um, what I, one of my favorite projects, we had students study Maya, Greece, Easter Island, and we found civilizations that have, have risen and fallen, and students had to figure out what is a common thread, and they had to theorize on what that is. They then had to take their social theory and manifest it in a mechanical way. And so we went through paper and iteration after iteration after iteration into wood, and um, finally into our final materials resulting in our um, exhibited project, which is a little over 250 pounds and about eight foot by eight foot. Wow. This is the apocalypto. That's the apocalypto project. Yeah. And part of that, and I've got four minutes, so I'm going to go fast. Um, as you can imagine, students aren't the only ones that are challenged by this. Uh, this is very uh, challenging to me as well. And I'm going to get off my soapbox for a sec and just say that uh, I have to completely own the fact I'm a new teacher. I am a couple years in. My pedagogy is like any new teacher's, and I am throwing hours at it right now. But there are a lot of things I think I can learn um, in general and from this room about just the, the like core teaching skills. Um, also, materials and equipment. I mentioned earlier, we, we are not a tech school. We do not have, uh, with the one exception, we do not have amazing equipment. And I spend as much as five hours a week fundraising, going to old men's garages to dig out old tools, like all the things you can imagine. Um, also a couple challenges, oops, 
that are specific to our school. Our school is full inclusion, which means we don't track or separate students by ability. And um, while that's great, it also makes it very hard to personalize on projects like this. I have everything from um, semi-aggressive autistic students to would-be gate students in my class. And I have 32 14-year-olds. So that makes it um, very challenging. Um, personally, though, there is one struggle that is the biggest for me. And that is that uh, throughout my life, I have had a mentor in every success I've ever had, personally and professionally. <coughs> and right now, I have advisors, I have resources and things like that. But I don't have some, someone to really share experience with that I can learn from. And that, um, as Gabriel was saying, makes it kind of very lonely and it makes it a little harder to grow. Um, and then there are some things I'm already doing. You've read my application. I'm not going to hash over these too much. Some new ones are. Uh, I'm working with Make Magazine. I, I think I'm going to get to write an article and we've exhibited a little bit of Maker Faire. But it is my nature kind of to kind of take that for granted already and be looking forward and up. And I know everybody, when they look up, kind of sees something different in the clouds. But when I think about what this program could be, whether communally or individually, uh, there's a couple characteristics that I think are really important. And one is professional mentorship and training. Uh, this program needs to be about more than students. It has to be about teachers. And I think the only way to train teachers is through um, residencies, internships, where they're actually sharing a long-term high stakes experience with other teachers. And I think that's the only way we can really um, disseminate this program. Um, also, we don't need to start from the ground up. We can leverage existing infrastructure. I've already talked with uh, our director of credentialing and teacher preparation. I've talked with teacher preparation at UCSD, San Diego State. I've talked with the STEM collaboratory. They're all like, oh yeah, we would love kind of some focus on how to help people. So we just need to leverage these things. We don't need to develop something from the ground up. Um, also, industry. I see a program, a place, where colleges and recruiters are frequent guests. They come in, they may be dabbling on their own things, they may be casually supporting students, or they may be there and we kind of are secretly trying to recruit them as teachers. But one of the most important things, and this is the last one, is I think we need to develop a brand. I've, I love this, but I, I really think it's sad that as a society, we have the marketing might to convince the world that you are a bad person if you don't have an apple and a coca-cola like we can do that as a society but we have so much difficulty really changing the public perception of education and i, I think that's kind of sad and um it sounds like it's something that's being thought of but i think that we could informed by actual research we do over the next year um really develop a brand both by our graduates and by just flat out marketing and if, if we think about uh these apprentices we could develop these residents. If we do two residents a year for five years, and each of them is doing two residents a year for five years, this program can grow exponentially and very quickly. So um, I know I'm just one of many, though, so I'm going to digress a little bit. And we are, have all kind of climbed our own mountain, and we're going to be talking about those today. And I know this is what I see when I look at the clouds, but what I'm excited about now is I get to see what you think about when you look at the clouds. Thank you. go to high tech high. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, I want to go to your classroom, Scott. I'm, yeah. I'm going to figure out something down there and spend a week with you guys. I'm going to be your classroom aide for one week. Okay. And I think that's going to happen everywhere. I, yeah. Like, what a fun year that would be. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about, I feel like we're all going to talk about the same thing. So I'm just going to bring, you know, my view. Some of it is going to sound like things Scott said, and some of it's going to be things you said. Um, but 
this notion, and I, I needed a word for it, and I just decided to call it experience-based learning or experiential learning. And it goes back to that thing that Mark said early on was, you know, school ought to be more like life than school is. Like we introduce these layers of abstraction between learning and, and, and life, and we can, it turns out we can productively collapse all of those down. You, school and life can be integrated. They, they can be one and the same. So um, to kind of understand this in my perspective, it, uh, you know, I went to school in the 70s. And it was a renaissance period, certainly in California, but I think across the United States. There were literally hundreds of inside the school district, on the campus, alternative school projects taking place. The laws for that are still on the books in California. And the only thing that killed all of those projects was the addition of a new um, requirement was that all of the kids in those alternative schools, program, alternative programs inside the school be tested in exactly the same way as the other kids were. And overnight, all of those programs shut down or mutated into hybrid partial programs. And so one of my efforts is to get that other, that last law modified again. But I grew up in Mendocino in one of those alternative schools. It was extremely project-based, and its goals were very broad. They wanted to combine children that were essentially truant with kids who were bored and uh, disconnected in, high, in school. And, uh, and so I came into a situation that looked like just a field of abundance to me, opportunity. The teachers were completely distracted by the children who needed the most support, and I was left alone to learn photography by building a dark room, to learn electronics by building special effects boxes for my guitar playing friends. And to I thought at that point, I was going to be an artist, and I drew. And I drew, and I drew, and I drew. And then one day, I met this machine, the Apple II. And this, you can see this as a pivotal moment in my life. I went from dividing my time between photography, electronics, and drawing to something on the order of six to eight hours a day of self-directed study on the Apple II to the point where, when I turned 16, I was writing code professionally. I rode that interest for 25 or 30 years. And to this day, I still write code recreationally. Um, that was the first crowbar I'd ever been given that I could use to visibly change the universe around me. And for me, that was an incredibly empowering thing. Um, all of that changed one night over dinner. I was having dinner with some friends. <coughs> and I was talking about the fact that these seminal experiences we had as kids, running around in the woods, unsupervised by parents, all day at the beach, nobody around, obviously rural experiences weren't available to kids today. And in fact, these very same people that I was having dinner with, who I'd grown up with, weren't letting their kids have the same kinds of experiences they had. Somehow, through this like lens of being a young parent, they saw that as unsafe behavior and that we barely survived that. And I started to promote the idea that maybe these were the very formative experiences that made us who we were today, and that by depriving that experience from their kids. So I foolhardishly uh, suggested maybe I should just open a summer camp and you guys can drop your kids off for a couple of weeks, and we'll do the things that you don't let them do, and I just won't tell you about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had five people signed up by the end of dinner, and one thing led to another, and I opened the camp on my house. I have a little piece of property down uh, south of San Francisco, and I, I opened our camp there, and we started building things. And I chose that not out of some high pedagogical goal, but just that in a little moment of self-reflection, I realized that everything I had learned I had learned in the process of doing. You know, that had been a hallmark of my career and my life as a student, which really only existed in that high school experience. I, I tried UC San Diego for a quarter, but I didn't know what to do in a classroom with 300 students. I just, it didn't seem possible that we were going to take all year to go through a textbook. So <clears throat> I never looked back from that. 
The only other thing that I thought of as a credential was that I'm incredibly, and I, I mean this in a kind of like near clinical sense, I am incredibly indulgent of my own curiosity. Like, uh, you know, uh, emptying the hot tub one day became this like art project of trying to control how the water splashed out, you know, and uh, I'm a kind of pathological doodler. Uh, um, I'm doing an experiment right now with uh, moving my doodling onto an iPad, and I, I sort of more or less love and hate it, but um, I, I'm a balancer of things, primarily rocks, but all sorts of things. And I have balanced thousands of rocks. <laughs> um, I can make perfectly round balls of sand, and I can teach kids how to do it, too. It, it's a viral infection. I have kids who've taught kids who've taught it's how to make perfectly round balls of sand. That gave me the sense that same playful attitude and curiosity could be the basis of what we did at the camp. And so camp started with an evening of like just wild conversation and, and doodling together. And to give you examples, this is, this is one of those doodles. It, it started out as just like a go-kart that you steer with your feet and then while we were sitting there, we thought, well, wouldn't it be more fun if you rode the go-kart like, like a boat to make it go? And so that was, that was our plan. We had uh, uh, three days left in the week of that camp, and this is what we built. Uh, we built three of these uh, kind of radically different designs. And much to my surprise, people were sending their kids to my camp from, Sophia came from Paris to come to my camp. And, uh, and I would take, at that point, I took 16 kids a year in two one-week sessions with eight kids. Talk about a limitation. I don't seem to be able to manage a classroom. The idea of uh, how many kids in your classroom, 32? Like, it just boggles my mind. And I, that's why I want to come see. Uh, like, um, we build really big. And the commitment comes from the fact that all of the things that we build, we're going to use. We're going to get on, get in, and go out on. This is a sail-powered train sitting on 11 miles of, un of uh, recently abandoned railroad track. We made it about a quarter mile with this train. But later, we did smaller trains, and we went, all, we went the whole distance. Um, the first year, we built this roller coaster at the culmination of our week of building has 120 feet of track. Um, our very first sailboat, ugly and slow, but the second and third iterations were lively and fast. They were quite yar. That's a term I learned during that. Um, this whole notion of iteration and the connection, the, kid, the emotional and intellectual connection the kids had to the projects because this is the Pacific Ocean. I think you guys are familiar with it up here. It's really cold. Mm -hmm. So the idea that you're going to go out in the ocean, here we're in the harbor, but the previous picture is in the actual ocean. That adds a certain amount of like intensity to the project, the meaning of building something that you're going to use. right? It has a full body commitment. <laughs> um, so I, I distilled these into a a kind of galvanizing phrase for me. The opportunities for engaged learning are inversely proportional to the knowability of the outcome. Part of what seemed to hold the students' attention in this experience was that we'd obviously just started from this dinner conversation, this sketch, to build these things. It was, there was no recipe or, or, or textbook that we were following. There was no known, nobody could tell us whether that sail train was going to work or not. There just there wasn't anything to refer to. <laughs> so that exploration of the unknown is mutual and shared with the teachers and the students. And that's when we started to reframe what we called a teacher as a collaborator. And that's a language idea that stayed with us. This notion of collaborating with the kids is more fluid than always being in that like teacher role with them. Sometimes you're just you're gonna get in that boat with them, you know. So not long after this, uh, my notebooks began to fill up with like new ideas, and and uh, these were coming from this like constant question that uh, returning students had for me, which was like, why isn't school more like this? You know, they were putting in six to ten hours a day sometimes, 
at camp, and granted, it's a one-week intensive camp, and maybe that's not a sustainable rate for a you know, 10-year-old child, but... <laughs> that's the spike here. That's the toy plant right there. Oh, nice. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, that's the toy you, that came out of that kid. That's the Holy toy that God. came out of that meeting with This is like... Yeah. <laughs> Wow. What are the odds? Right? What are the odds? <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what? Um, wow. Sorry. That's <laughs> incredible, Glenn. I, yeah. can't, I can't. What a way to close that circle. Okay, so. <laughs> so that conversation with the kids of like, why wasn't their classroom experience more engaging, right? That, that was a recurrent theme. And granted, none of my kids were going to your programs because. Uh, because I see engagement in in everything you showed, Scott. I, I think these same principles, like, are common themes in these programs here. But I started to play with that idea and try to figure out, like, how do you address those concerns of core curriculum and things like that. And uh, I, it, it all came down to me in this one drawing, which I, I actually did this version of the drawing for um, Sir Ken Robinson. And, and made, I, I think I shared with you guys the comic book that I made out of this. Yeah. That was, I actually made that comic book to explain my idea to Ken Robinson so that he would answer my phone call. And it worked. So just, <laughs> <laughs> um, that was a great moment. Um, all those names you put on your slide, Carol Dweck, and um, th there were two Pauls that I had. Duckworth. Yeah, but Duckworth and Dweck are both like heroes of mine. Um, but this notion of reframing education around a, a, a much larger, longer time period, instead of days with 45-minute periods, but these long periods of engagement with ideas. And, and this is what we came up with, is this, like, take a single topic, and in this case, win, and explore it for a long period of time. We've since extended this. Nine weeks is the shortest we do, and the longest ones we do now are 15 or 17 weeks. Um, they're like semesters, kind of, you know. To take a single idea, wind, salt, fairness, you know, the, these tiny little ideas and treat them as like keyholes to another universe. It turns out it's the same universe you're standing in, it's just different perspectives. And, and that's incredible. And the kids make deep connections to the uh, individual experiences they have and they discover new connections for themselves. and. And out of that exploration, they write proposals for work that they're going to do, what we call a declaration. That sets them up for the expression phase, which is a long period where you come into school in the morning. There's a few minutes of coordination. Maybe we have an expert coming in, someone you're going to meet with. And then it's like back to the project. You know, It's shocking for kids who transfer in from other schools to find out that their whole day is just working on their project. Not just one day of it, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and on and on and on. Am I running? I'm, I'm headed for the home plate here. <laughs> this is, you didn't say it, but this is your learning arc. This is our learning arc. Yeah, we call it the arc in these three phases. And then the exposition phase where they demonstrate, share their findings, um, uh, admit to the things that, that were bigger than they could handle, and um, to, uh, to celebrate all of their peers' work and all of that is really wonderful. And the experts, and now that the neighborhood has gotten used to it, all of our neighbors come in and uh, enjoy these exposition nights. So I could spend all day on that. But once I had that idea, I signed the lease on 10,000 square feet of commercial real estate in San Francisco. And believe me, for uh, no longer employed person from the world of technology, that was a kind of like leap of faith. But we had these two guiding principles. One, this would be the most engaging place in the child's life. If they weren't excited to be here, we weren't doing it right. That was our internal litmus test. And the second one was, everything is interesting. And if we couldn't infect the kids with that idea, we also, it, it wasn't working. And we needed to keep working on it which was another important idea. If it wasn't working, we wouldn't quit. What kind of role model would that be? We would keep working on it. So the school itself became our first project. 
and continues to be a recurrent project for us. The kids have better ideas than we do about ways to build learning environments. <coughs> so we built them together. Three years later, we have these incredibly uh, inventive, creative, not always legal um, <laughs> learning spaces uh, that, that are a co-creation with the students. <coughs> they are emotionally connected to the school in ways that I, I, I can't uh, illustrate in a, in a couple of slides. But uh, in general, the shared learning spaces focus inward. The kids are always around tables. Everything, everybody can see what everybody else is doing. Uh, the, the work itself is a kind of continual co-creation. The curriculum, in a certain sense, is co-created with the kids. They learn very quickly in their first year at the school that a good question, a good idea, will change the plan. And the positive feedback from that is incredible. The, the, the day that your question changes what's going to happen tomorrow is it, like is perfect feedback for kids about the value of engaging with what's being put forth. It's an amazing shop. I, I, it sounds like all of us have kind of dabbled and put together a, something like that. We called it a keystone of the entire facility. So there's tools here. Walk up access to every tool for kindergarten through 12th grade. Responsibility first. If you can't self-manage, you lose access to the shop, and then you earn that back. And so very quickly, even our six-year-olds can be trusted with uh, utility knives, with drills, with all of that. Um, jump. So uh, I tried to think of what was an important current challenge. And uh, this is one that's like I could use some help on. Uh, highly effective young adults with extraordinary creative capacity, collaboration, and tenacity are valued by the marketplace, but not higher ed. Stanford and MIT both have these alternative admissions pathways that are getting kind of interesting, portfolio-based. That Those were custom made for us. But organizations like the uh, University of California and places like that are present Byzantine challenges to any alternatively educated child. Um, and that makes parents nervous. Like the closer our students get to high school age, the more nervous those parents get. And so I need to gather evidence of the efficacy and life value of this kind of education from all of your programs to share with our parent body to calm down that nervousness, because that nervousness infects the kids, even when they don't want it to. Like some of our most committed parents can't help but bleed over. Um, so I think that our definition of higher ed is lagging behind some of the innovation that's happening here. Definitely you can cherry pick examples where it isn't. But I think in general, as we look out at the college university landscape, their expectations are not well aligned. And in fact, what I'm finding as I go and meet with these people is that their admissions staff is very far out of alignment with their actual teaching staff and the goals that they're trying to accomplish. And so the admissions staff is pulling those 4.5 grade average students with the standard defensible credentials and skipping over all of those interesting outliers, all of those really like valuable kids out there who could be going to university and college with intent rather than as a default next behavior after high school. Um, and I don't know if you see this in your classrooms, because a lot of you are in public and charter situations where you have a good gender balance. But uh, 9 out of 10 applicants to our program are boys 8 to 11 years old right at that stage where boys uh, act up in classroom when they become dissatisfied with the textbook, the sitting in a desk, not being allowed to move around while they're thinking. I think most of those kids could be saved if you just made a section in the back with a quiet carpet on it and just let them walk around while they're watching the lecture. <laughs> um, and then the future. 
you know, uh, Brightworks, uh, our school, serves about 33 students right now. Next year we'll be somewhere in the 42 to 48. Um, it, it exists as a kind of petri dish where this little protected experiment is going on to say, let's put aside our cultural expectations of education and just reimagine it in, in a holistic and more modern viewpoint. Um, I think that's good value, but a lot of people are now showing up asking if they can borrow ideas and incorporate things, and I just, I, I honestly don't know how to support those people. Um, but, uh, you know, um, I meet almost a hundred people a year who've been to High Tech High, educators who visited High Tech High up and visit us, uh, either next or before visiting you guys. Um, so I see it as a, as a, uh, rena as a new renaissance period, like the one that I enjoyed, in education where individual uh, ideas and the creativity of the student might be celebrated and fostered through their, through their student careers. So, yeah. Um, I think that's my last slide. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Gary. Yeah. <laughs> Break, which will be in just a few minutes. Oh. What? Does he get us five minutes of questions? Or? Yeah. Let's, oh. let's talk for a little while. We have, what? Questions for both Scott and Gabriel. Yeah, for Scott and Gabriel both. Uh, we have a few minutes before the break. Let's ask questions or talk to them. Yeah. I have something for, for Gabriel, actually. Oh. And things I think would be really. Let's, yeah. let's field the questions from up here. Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, that, that I'm ex excited about again, having a group of people. Because it, it turns out that you see. The, the very question you're asking, they're, they're actually asking the same question right now. Ah. And I have a meeting on the 20th with the Dean of the School of Engineering and the Dean of the School of Environmental Design who's saying, okay, how do we integrate with what you're doing into our school? And I would invite you to come with me. I so want to come with we'll you. So that we'll go and we'll kind of say, it's not just one school in the Nevada, it's actually there's a whole school that started and yeah. there's this whole cohort of people that are doing the very thing. Yeah. You have to find a way to kind of bring them in and we'll happy to work with you to help make it happen. So the 20th, okay. at 2 o'clock. <laughs> okay. Right in the I middle of my staff up, development yeah. week, but I'll... Uh, I'm anyway, so is yeah, yeah. invitation? One thing, like, I don't know, like, I think about the same thing you said about college. I personally, I went to a good engineering school. I thought college was a waste of time. I would almost petition businesses to say, don't value college, just skip it all together. I, yeah. I, I think that it, as it is now, that there is value outside of it that we could do. And that's not even talking about the financial value for yeah. parents and all that other stuff. You know, a question we often get asked is, you know, how do you know that your kids are learning? And parents have, all, like, even the most well-intentioned parents are like, is it okay if I just take my student out and have her tested on, you know, such and so day or something like that? And um, I, I give them this, uh, this white paper from that professor down in, um, uh, at UCLA, the chemistry professor, who gave the chemistry, freshman chemistry test on a Friday, and gave the exact same test on a Monday, and on Friday the kids all scored where he expected them to score based on their previous scores, and on Monday there was no correlation, <laughs> and in fact 80% of the students thought it was an entirely new test, and I think that that speaks to the fact, and you know, my wife is kind of a litmus case for this of graduating with a math degree and now remembering none of it, you know, I, I think because those learning experiences aren't anchored in any way, they are transient, you know, and I, and I would agree with Scott, <laughs> and what? And expensive. And expensive, yeah. So, so I have a question. Yeah, um, yeah. Residencies and internships. Um, I want to explore that idea a little bit. So I've heard a couple of times in places that, that really the sharing of your work is best done by somebody who comes and gets engaged and participates and sees and works. and Yeah. Is. So that's one, one strand. The other strand that I was wondering about is what about residencies and internships for your learning? Is that something you want to do? Is it, is it a symmetrical thing? Or yeah. let's talk a little bit about residencies and internships. Is that, is that something that we should think about ways to create so that you can share your work? Or what, what do you think? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> All of <them. laughs> um, for, for the summer camp program, there, there are eight other summer camps based on tinkering school now scattered around the world. And, those people who started those all came and spent a, like a couple of weeks, you know, certainly I think the least was one week, 
at our camp, just living and and treating the whole students <coughs> as an immersive um, training program, essentially. And, and 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 without exception, they all commented on the fact, like, man, I just feel like in one week I got I, I got like more than a year's worth of college education, you know. And because they were working directly with the kids, and then. The dinner conversation with the kids and with those people is all about like how does tinkering school work and I think we forget the the ability of the kids to teach teachers, you know. That's a and I, I mean I have a piece to add because um, you guys were talking both you and me were talking about uh, like where do we find the time yeah. and I think there's like a couple of advantages. One, you, you do need to be immersed somewhere where you're present. I know like right now. We all have classes going on without us, and so at best we can be 75% present right now because we're thinking about what's happening in our other job. Um, but I think when you have a resident, it can also, if you leverage it, it right, you can give them a little more responsibility and be kind of a mentor to them while you maybe do some of these other things that you never have time to get to. So I think that's one interesting part of it. But I mean, I think about every experience I remember about learning in my life, and my my fiance begged me to take out this like two minute mentor tribute I had in my original presentation. Because <laughs> I wanted to like show like these yeah. are the people, this is this yeah. is why. And so like, I think every one of those experiences I had was because like all the finance stuff. I went to, I didn't know anything about net present value. The assistant treasurer of Kaiser Permanente took me to lunch a bunch and just like taught me everything. Yeah. And I think that's everything about it. Yeah. So it might be something just as a put on a note that the group could work on together to say how do we design and do right. residencies either individually right. or collectively, or we yeah. use a good discussion point to say, you know, how do we do it on our own? How do we do it together? Because they should be mutually beneficial, right? Yeah. If, if it's just a drain on on our resources, right? It, it'll never be effective. But if it's if there's a shared benefit there, and you know, like our, our classrooms, we we've done like shadow days and things like that where other teachers have asked and. You know, 99% of the time we say, yes, come on in. You know, we're not quite sure what's good. You know, we often don't know what's happening on a particular day, three weeks in advance, um, which is a beautiful thing. But the, um, the teachers show up, and, you know, as much as they get to hang out in that classroom with that other teacher and they're, they're seeing how things work, it's inevitable they end up working with a couple of students, you know, in the same way that the teachers do and just starting to emulate those behaviors. But logistically, it's, it's an overhead. It's almost like we need them to stay for a couple of days so that then that teacher can see the, the benefit of it. Yeah. So I'm of substrands of sort of collaborative design and, and discussion here, and one might be how do we how do we create these residencies and, and so forth? Uh, and how, uh, this strikes me as a good yeah. sub sub And then I put it on the oh, nice. big topic list along yeah. with the whole higher ed relationship issue. Yeah, yeah. big topic. And I think the symmetry is important though, because like, yeah. I want to be one of the mentees yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, one thing I didn't get to in my presentation was initially when I framed the idea of the school. I recognize that being in that environment would generate a lot of like really good ideas, and it's true. At Brightworks, like we keep this catalog, this like growing catalog of like somebody should make that. Like, you know, it, it's like the intellectual property of the school in a certain sense. But of course, we share it all on the blog. But the the original funding model for the school was we'll siphon that IP off, license it out to various manufacturers and things like that. And that'll pay for, you know, the tuition. And we can break that gap between public and private school by making a private school that didn't cost any money, because all of its, you know, revenue would come from these ancillary, right. you know, other streams. The problem with that was, you know, from a parental perspective, it looked like we were stealing their children's ideas, mm -hmm. and uh, it looked like some new 21st century form of of child labor. So, so now we, we do a slight variation. This year is a new experiment in like cherry picking a few of the ideas that the teaching staff have had of like, oh, I wish I had this thing for my classroom, and starting to prototype and make those. And of course, the kids take that over. 
but they now they're doing it in support of the school instead of us taking their ideas. But Do the parents in your school want their kids to go to college? It, boy, it is a mix. They all want that to be an option. That's you know. the Do the parents Do in our school the want their kids to go to college? We're, we're in the heart of San Francisco. Almost all of our parents work at one startup or another. You know, um, a lot of them, you know, are uh, two income households working at two different startups that they're primary shareholders in and things like that. So we cross like economic spectrum that goes from, you know, very close to the bottom to uh, very close to the top. And universally, the only expectation they have is college will always be an option, right? So we have to speak to that or else, like last year, we lost nine kids because we weren't speaking clearly enough to that. And that's a big... That's a big loss for a small school. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. now we do. And again, I think Larry, as an advisor, has talked to some about this issue. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I have a a good, he would so be a good, great. He would be good person that. to talk yeah. to this issue because he's yeah. he's really uh, yeah. As far as I can tell, he's put some thought into having some arguments. And it, and data again, I feel like just a body of reference and research we can point to. And like I recently came across a study kind of longitudinal study of Sudbury school graduates. And like those kids, 50% more likely to complete their college education, 70% more likely to have careers in whatever degree field they had in college. I mean, it, you know, there appears to be evidence out there that engagement and experience-based learning is effective as a, for, for like post 10 years from high school. But, you know, I, I feel like we need a place to condense that to help those parents be more confident and uh, more willing to, like, commit to this idea. Yeah, I think there's a, a cynical argument that we're preparing kids for really uh, to be strong, to survive the Arctic, to survive the desert, to survive college like yeah. classrooms, uh, really nasty environments. Um, <laughs> yeah. To yeah. survive all the places. Well, yeah, our narrative is that. Um, Maybe everybody doesn't need to go to college, but we're preparing our kids, but kids, not just ours. Yeah. Kids uh, should not be segregated from those who are and be in a program that prepares them and expects that they might be. Yeah. So, because I, th I think a lot of parents are going to hear it. Well, I'm making a choice now about my, what's in you know, Oh, yeah. And they're going to, that would scare. I can see why you're losing some yeah. people. Although, I have to say, and I, I just realized I don't have a picture of it, but when, a, when an eight year old spends two weeks hand constructing a fine piece of furniture in a process that's incredibly arduous and requires precision, those eight-year-old Brightworks natives are convincing those parents who transferred in and have like 12-year-old students at Brightworks, they see the eight-year-old's work and they're like, I want to see that coming out of my daughter or son. Right. You know, that's why I'm here. So we're starting to have those proofs that, that extend beyond those kind of rote college expectations, you know, but um, it's definitely a, an area of development. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Take a break. Yeah, take a little bit. Yeah. Maybe we should start at about 10 minutes to 11. Yeah. Yeah. That'll be... So we're actually like 15 minutes ahead of schedule? Could that be possible? Yeah, that's great. I think that's good for Glenn and then get started. Yeah. So ten minutes to eleven, we'll take. We'll start again with uh, Glenn. All right. All right. But that is too funny. Would be odd. That's crazy. This is a product that I was working on. I was actually going to show it. This is an example. It's in the world's first open source product. If you exclude the like, my big blue buildings. And so I designed this in essentially uh, thinking about what plant the program that you have in San Francisco. And uh, yeah. 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 talk to some of the Isn't that what somebody knows? Isn't that right? Yeah. It's an yeah. 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 inner city school. Yeah. 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 That's really but, uh, yeah. I know it's really fun. Because we're in the world of the city. But it was just enough that it's cool. Crack me up when I saw that product. I think that was one of the first ideas to go away with like.
the traditional classes. Yeah, no, it can happen yeah. during the day. Yeah. 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 Well, there is a different remark. It says we create innovation in a culture of traditional values. And so he's, he's really thought about how to do this without crashing because you violated 